All right, if you found your way to Ephesians chapter 3, I I entitled this message something like, well, what did I call it? Uh, Prayer and Revelation. Because that's basically what's in the chapter. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about prayer. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about revelation as a concept or something. But it's kind of the structure of the uh, chapter that we find ourselves in here. So prayer and revelation is what we will read. We're going to read through the whole chapter, and then we'll come back and walk through some of the thoughts there that struck me. Verse 1 of chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, and in my Bible there's a uh, punctuation mark there that is not found in the original language or in the original Greek or anything. There's a dash right after that. There's a hyphen there. And we're going to talk about why if you haven't figured it out already. Verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of man, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus, or in Christ, through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God, given to me by the effective working of his power. All one sentence from verse (laughs) 1. Verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And now the other half of the hyphen should show up right here. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to read the first verse of the next chapter just to give you a clue as to how this book is going to change from uh, after today in our study into our next study. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And he goes on from there. The book of Ephesians is a very typical and very obvious uh, structuring of the way Paul structures most of his epistles. He spends the first part of the epistle identifying theological truths, revelations. He gives us knowledge of God at the highest levels. And then somewhere in the course of the book, different places, in this one it ends up being right in the middle because it's the end of chapter 3, beginning of chapter 4. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are all the therefore. Okay, because of what all I told you before, therefore, here's some practical stuff on how to order your life. You see, the Bible is not a book that is just full of theological truths and philosophies and deep ideas that we can just mull and meditate upon and wonder what in the world difference does this make in my life. 
because Paul uses the word therefore and says, okay, I told you all this amazing stuff because of this, therefore, hey, let's look at how that should affect your life in dealing with the people in this world and how to walk worthy of the calling, which is where he starts here. How to, how to live in your life with your family, with your husband, with your wife, with your children, with your parents, with your neighbors, with your friends. How do you interact with people? How do we deal with the world at large? All that stuff, he gives us very practical stuff. And that's where we're going to end up. It's almost like there's almost two different books all in one. But it's very good because if our theology is just philosophy, it's worthless. It's worthless. Jesus said, was it Jesus or no, it was Paul, who said, the demons believe. What good is it doing them? So what? The demons understand theology. They have an insight because they are spirits and not bodies. They have an insight into spiritual things that actually we don't fully have. We get revelation, but we don't live constantly in the realm of the spirit. They do. They see and they know things that we don't, spiritually speaking. We know what we need to know. We live on a need-to-know basis, and here's what we need to know. It's right here. He's given it to us. There's other stuff going on. We come to it sometimes in the Scripture. You get to a point, and if I'm teaching on that, you've heard me say, yep, that's what it says. I don't know what it means. You know, it might mean this, might mean that, but I'm not sure, and evidently it's not important enough for us to know because otherwise the Lord would open it up for us. They know. They understand the theology, but it hasn't changed them. And if our theology doesn't initiate, I guess is the word, and foster and empower a change of heart and a walking each day in this world in a different way, then it's just another philosophy. And that's how the world has cate categorized it. It's interesting when you think about, if you step back and look at world wisdom and world philosophy and just kind of, you know, step back and look at the world. And it places Christianity in all of the categorization of the rest of the philosophies of this world, of which you can study forever philosophy from all the different cultures of the world, and they're not life-changing. They're not transformative. We can try and read them and go, I will transform my life to fit like this. We could do that. But the philosophy itself is not transformative. The gospel is transformative. It's the gospel itself that saves you, not your full understanding of it. If that were the case, none of us would be saved because none of us really fully understand the gospel, right? But the gospel itself is transformative. It's living. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword and more powerful than any other philosophy that there is. Oh, other philosophies are interesting and some of them hold truth and some of them hold a lot of lie. And usually they're all a bit of a mixture of both. But they're not transforming your life but the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms your life and my life and it's in the act of doing that and that's why we study it that's why we dig into it is because I don't know about you but I I need and desire to be transformed some more God ain't done with me yet there's more work to be done and he said that earlier in chapter two we are his workmanship he's working on us we're all fixer-uppers for the Lord in various stages of construction, right? And so Paul, in this very tangible way in this book, divides up between the theology and the therefore. And it's important to understand the therefore and all of those things. We don't want to throw them out as some accused Paul of, of saying, 
You're preaching lawlessness because you're no longer holding to the Torah and all of the kosher law and all of the rules and regulations. And you preach this and people are just going to go crazy if all they have to do is believe in Jesus. And you know what? There are Christians and Christian groups today who kind of hold on to that. They might not speak that, but that's the way they live and the way they project the truth of the gospel. They project it as a new set of rules and regulations. There are things that we should do and not do in our lives, but they're based on the truth of who God is and the foundational relationship that we have with God, for we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast, for his, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he ordained for us beforehand that we should walk in them. That, that's, that's the whole thing right there. That's the whole thing right there. And so, as we complete this section of the first half of the book of, of Ephesians, Paul starts for say, by saying, you know, a, after he's talked about we are saved by grace through faith. And remember last week we talked about the fact that he has created one new man out of two so that they're no longer one, but we're one, and it's already done. And, and he's talked about that. You, you're no longer strangers and aliens, and we are no longer separated from God because of our, our sin. Talking about Jews and Gentiles, but he has created one new man. And then he says, for this reason, because he has done all this, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, and then he goes on a diversion until... Verse 14. Basically, verse 1 ties to verse 14. And verses 2 through 13 are a whole different thing that he kind of got sidetracked on. Right? Verse 1, he's really introducing the fact that he's praying for them. But he got sidetracked on what his mystery is about. And I, it's not really a sidetrack. I, should, I shouldn't say that. It seems like one, kind of. But it's not because he wants us to understand something. We're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk about the revelation, the mystery, Paul calls it. And he defines it once again here. He's already talked about it. He already said, I've, I've talked to you a little bit about this already. We'll talk about the revelation. We're going to talk about Paul's calling. He wants them to understand his calling and in the right context. So he doesn't want to get them to get it out of whack. And then we'll get into Paul's prayer. So first of all, the revelation, verse 2. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now, dispensation. There's a theological term if you've studied uh, different theologies and, and so forth, and especially one of the theologies of the day in the last hundred years is dispensationalism. And we as Calvary Chapel are somewhat dispensationalist in our theology, not strict dispensationalist. The idea in, in this theological thing is there are different disp dispensations of God's dealing with man. And the people that take it to the extreme say, your way to be in God's grace to be saved, to have a relationship with God, is different in each one of these dispensations. For Adam and Eve, they had to obey and not eat of the fruit in the garden. That was the dispensation. Then there was the dispensation of Noah, and then the dispensation of the law, and different people come up with different ideas of how many dispensations there are. And if you take it too far, you get to the point of saying, okay, so Jews in the Old Testament, they were saved because they kept the kosher law. Nah, nah. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. I quoted it. I encourage you to memorize it. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's as true today as it was when Adam and Eve were in the garden. It's been the same thing that God has been doing. The expression of that and his instruction and leadership and all of those things have been unique and have been growing and have been moving toward a purpose. They've not been static. God is not static. He's dynamic. But the relationship with God from the creation has been based on grace 
through faith. God's grace through faith in him and not of ourselves. But it's interesting to think about the history of God's revelation in dispensational, in dispensations. And if you think of it that way, well, we're in the church age, you could call it, or the church dispensation. I like church age better. And then there's going to be another age. There's going to be the kingdom age, the millennial kingdom age, right? When Jesus comes and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two from east to west, I think it says. And, you know, there's going to be a whole change of things, but the earth itself is still going to be the earth as we know it, except the Lord God through Jesus Christ will live on the earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. And that's the millennial age. And then, boom, there's a big If you think today stuff is kind of crazy and there's a kind of warfare and people at each other and stuff, at the end of the millennial reign, man, Satan's going to be let loose with all of the demons out of the abyss and he's going to go and it says, even after a thousand years of Jesus Christ reigning, he's going to deceive the nations and they're going to rise up in rebellion against King Jesus. Are you kidding me? Really? Wow. Yeah. We human beings are so fickle. My kingdom was overtaken by Jesus Christ, by King Jesus. And yet, I, I still get deceived into thinking my way is better than his, or that this, that, or something else. And human nature, it, it hasn't, hasn't fully changed. But, then at the end of that conflagration at the end of the millennial age then everything gets redone a new heaven and a new earth created that's a whole nother age and then who knows what's after that because as we've seen the bible talks about the ages to come not the age to come but in the ages to come interesting Interesting. But here, it's not talking about that. So you see, I just did what Paul did. I just took a whole nother trail because I want to let you know about dispensationalism, but that's not what this word means here. The idea here is the stewardship, and depending upon what translation you have, it might say stewardship instead of dispensation. He's talking about, hey, the Lord gave me grace for you in order to do what? The, the stewardship or dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've already briefly written, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay, what is this mystery? What does mystery mean? You know, when I was a kid, I used to love mystery books. I was an avid reader when I was a kid, and I was... in. in you know, in the late 50s, very early 60s, kid books, man, the Hardy Boys. I waited for the next volume to come out. I had them all lined up on my bookcase, you know. And Tom Swift, Tom Swift and his, if you've ever heard of, how many people have ever heard of Tom Swift? Okay, we're all over, most of us anyway, over X uh, age. Um, I don't know, in all the Marvel comics and everything else, I haven't seen a Tom Swift movie. That, that might be cool, actually. But there, there was kind of a mystery about it. There was something you didn't know at the beginning of the book that they had to figure out. For Tom Swift, it was some scientific thing that he was going to prove or he was going to solve a big problem by, you know, doing something scientific. The Hardy Boys were trying to solve some crime or some other thing. I had the full volume of Sherlock Holmes from Arthur Conan Doyle. It's a book about this thick. And... Uh, got that in and I I read every one of them a couple of times and I loved that I still today enjoy that if I watch something on TV if it's a mystery I like that I like that okay there's something you got to figure out and maybe they're going to figure it out maybe they're not maybe I'm going to figure it out I enjoy that that's not the mystery that's talked about here 
You see a pattern in what I'm, how I'm doing this? Okay. So to, to someone in Paul's day, the word mystery uh, brought about a whole idea of what was popular in the day, which were mystery religions. The mystery religions. In the book of Revelation, it talks about mystery Babylon because of the whole idea of the mystery religions were this idea where uh, there was some truth that the gods or God or some force had revealed to only a simple few, and you could be initiated to be brought into this knowledge, and that initiation would be some kind of ceremony or something else. There are mystery religions that are being practiced today. Really? In America? Really? Yeah. Yeah. There are organizations whereby, uh, and they do uh, lots of uh, charitable things, and they're large organizations, and they have uh, meetings. We actually rented one of their facilities for six months in the early days of this church, and um, came to learn a little bit more about it and, and saw some of the rooms where the special stuff was kept, where they bring out literally an altar and people kneel down before it and they are knighted and they've got funny hats and there are orders. And once you get to a certain order, then you get to learn more. That's the concept of a mystery religion, right? Now, Paul talks about mystery in that background and context to the Christians in Ephesus and in other places in the scriptures. But Christianity is not a mystery religion. Know that. Christianity is not a mystery religion. But in a sense, there was this amazing mystery, and that's the way Paul is using this term, of the concept, and he's talked about it already, he's going to talk about it in a minute, that the Gentiles and the Jews are brought together to be one person. I think it's J. Vernon McGee who said before Christ, there were Jews and Gentiles. After Christ, there were Jews, Gentiles, and Christians. Now, that's one way to think about it, but building one out of, out of the two, that's what God has done. And this whole idea was something that people, it was before them if they had studied a little bit deeper with an open mind to the books of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, even Ezekiel and some of the other prophets and the revelation of God in the, in the Torah and so forth. But they didn't grasp hold of this idea that, wait a minute, Jews are to be a light to the Gentiles and we're supposed to be all in one fellowship together rather than separate. Because they couldn't justify that against all the stuff where the Lord was saying, hey, come out of her, be ye separate. Hey, don't do as the rest of the world. And they had trouble understanding how to put those two things together. And I would too, and so would you in that context. But now the mystery is revealed. Paul talks about it as the mystery hidden from all ages. It's now revealed, but it's not just revealed to the initiated. That's the big difference here. It's not that, okay, if you come in, we'll teach you the secret handshake and the special song. And then you will know the mystery. No, Paul's declaring it everywhere he goes. And so should we of what Christ has done. That's the sense of this word that he uses here, mystery. He made known to me the mystery. Now, as soon as Paul said that, I can imagine his mind went to, oh, wait a minute, i got to clarify this because as soon as I say, well, a mystery has been revealed to me. Now that just, you know, I'm growing taller, stronger, handsomer, younger, because I have this mystery and I will, well, I will dispense it to you. I will be a steward of the mystery and I'll, I'll give you some of it, but not too much and there will be a fee. So 
That's what many do today. That's what many do today. But what Paul is saying is, no, this mystery has been given to me, but let me make sure you understand the mystery and my calling. Verse 5, which in other ages, speaking of the mystery, was not made known to the sons of man, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Oh, okay, Paul. So you're not the only one, but you holy apostles and prophets, you know, okay, there's a whole band of you guys that have got this. That's not what he's saying here. This is what God has done. Those who were set apart for this thing. Paul talks about it in another place that he was separated from his mother's womb to the work that God had for him. Even though he was many years, decades, not living in that plan that God had for him fully and completely, right? Okay, so it's been revealed not just to me, but to the, the, the chosen ones ones, the set-apart ones, the, the apostles and prophets, and here's the mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. To the Jewish mind, that's incomprehensible. But it's exactly what the mystery was. The Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Now, we talked about that back in chapter 1, I think it is, in the beginning of 2, where Paul talks about the great power of God and the effective power of his working and the superabundance, amazing power of God directed usward. And now he says, yeah, and it was, uh, it was directed meward. And what was the accomplishment of that? I became a servant. Minister equals servant. I became a servant of this mystery. I became a servant in the sense of making sure it gets out and distributing it to all. Okay? So that's the revelation. What's the calling? He picks it up in verse 8. To me, okay, now he gave it to all the apostles, he gave it to me, but now, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints. That's what Paul's idea was of himself. He did not see a reason to learn to love himself. He did not see a reason to boost himself up in his own eyes. In other places, he says, hey, you know what? We need to think soberly about it ourselves. You could say it another way. Don't get drunk in admiring yourself. Don't get intoxicated by your assessment of what a great person you are, all your strengths and so forth. But think soberly. You know what? You have strengths. You say, Pastor, of course I know that. Or maybe you say, no, I really don't. You do. You do. And you have weaknesses. Yep, you've got them both. And what the Lord calls us to do is to think soberly about that. For years I've been involved in music since, since I was a kid. Music was just part of my life and always wanted to play and try different instruments, been in different bands before Christ, uh, um, since being in Christ, love to be able to participate in uh, the worship team here. It's just part of me. And, you know, I've, I, I can't think of a particular person in mind, but I know that I have encountered people who have shared with me the, uh, the fact that they, they felt like they were called to a music ministry. And in reality, they had no musical capability. Right? They couldn't sing. They couldn't play a, a, a musical instrument. They couldn't keep a beat. Okay, well, 
I know God can change someone miraculously. Absolutely, he could do that. But absent of that, you need to think soberly of yourself. If you feel called to a music ministry and you have no musical talent whatsoever, then you need to work at developing some skill in music, right? Go to school, learn how to sing, learn how to play an instrument, learn how to read music, do something to pursue that, right? That's thinking soberly. At the same time, I've, I have met people who were phenomenal in their musical capability. But they're not called to music ministry. Their heart has not been changed by it. Their heart has not been changed to be a servant of the dispensation of grace given by God of music. Oh, they could, they could play. They could outplay anybody I've ever known. But that is not big. And if they suddenly thought, well, I, I'm called to music ministry. Okay. Maybe you are. But it's music ministry. Servanthood. Serving the Lord. And this is true for anything. So as you look at your life, and, and, and you may think, well, these are, my, these are my strengths. This is what God ought to do with me. Well, you know, we don't give him suggestions or directions. We receive from him instructions. That's the way it works. And if we sense that we are called to something and we look at ourselves and go, I can't do that. Come on, Moses said that. Moses was called, and, and he kept saying, I can't do that. I, 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 can't, I, don't, I don't speak very well. I, I can't do that. And the Lord kept saying to him, well, then this is what we'll do. Well, then this is what we'll do. You know, you have a brother Aaron. He's a pretty good speaker. We'll bring him along and he'll come alongside you and so forth. And the Lord was very gracious and open to him as he recognized all of his weaknesses and brought them before the Lord. You know where it says the Lord got angry? It's when he said, I won't. Yeah, that's different. That's different. So you feel called to something. You go, I'm scared to death to talk up in front of people. And you, you want me to be an evangelist in arenas? Lord, you got, you, you got to help me here. And the Lord will. If, the, if it, the Lord is in it, then he will equip. I've said it before. I learned it from Pastor Chuck, and, and I hold to it. Absolutely. The Lord doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. That's what he does. But we have to look soberly at what we have and give it all unto the Lord, both our weaknesses and our strengths. And so Paul here has the right attitude. Hey, I'm the least of the least of the saints. He's just said, I've been given a mystery that no one for all the millennia before has known. It's been given to me, but I'm the least of the least of the saints could be why the Lord gave him that revelation, because he had the right heart after his heart was changed by Jesus Christ. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the ministry, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus." What's he supposed to do? Preach among the Gentiles to make all see the fellowship of the, ministry, of the mystery. The fellowship. This is the two becoming one. This is one man out of two. This is, no, it isn't we'll have a Gentile church and we'll have a Jewish church. It's a, boom, we'll have a church. And all are welcome. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the, I'm sorry, I lost my place here, uh, what is the fellowship of the ministry, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to who? To the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. 
wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to make it known to the world. Aren't we supposed to go preach to the world, right? That's what God's doing, and that's what Paul was doing. Yeah, and more. This was a mystery to the principalities and the powers. And we as the church declare to the spiritual world at hand, even you individually and the testimony that you have, you declare to the spirits the mystery of God. The grace of God given. That we believe in grace is given. It's amazing. It's amazing. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. The result, Paul's declaration of his ministry, one of his main messages is, look, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Not through our works, not through how good we are, not through all of our talents or anything else, but rather we have boldness and access with confidence. Don't ever let the enemy of your souls convince you that you can't approach the Lord God for whatever reason he may put in your brain. Oh, you haven't done enough. Oh, you haven't whatever. Oh, you have done this. Oh, whatever. It's a lie. It's a lie. If he can separate you, then he's got you. It's what wild animals do. I've told the story about my dog in the past who got out in, in, uh, and began running around a herd of cattle that somebody had. And I thought, oh, how cute. Isn't that neat? And the guy next to me said, no, he's trying to separate one of the calves. We were watching uh, BBC. I love these, you know, nature shows, the Planet Earth series and stuff. It's just phenomenal. This creation of God is amazing. And, and they've done some uh, pretty incredible photography and so forth to be able to watch this. And I saw the same thing they were talking about. I saw just a few moments of it before I fell asleep. And, and it was talking about the Himalayas and, and how tall they are and the highest peaks. And 10% of the people that try to uh, get to the top of the Himalayas dies. 10%. That's pretty high. And he quoted some uh, proverb, I think he said it was a Lebanese proverb, that um, the Himalayas are higher than a bird can go. But then, of course, they use that as an introduction to these particular cranes that actually fly over the Himalayas. And then, of course, as they always do, if you've watched these, you, you kind of know the, the pattern of what they do. Okay, they're flying over there, but they've got a predator, the eagles. Right, And there's this huge flock of crane, special kind of crane that are flying uh, nearby. I don't think it was while they were at the peak or coming over the peak. And here comes this eagle. And it was the same thing. Two eagles, and they separated one of the cranes from the rest of the flock. And boom, that was it. You know, they swooped down. Got, and that's what any enemy will do. It's tried to separate you. That's why it's so important to stay connected to the body of Christ. Coming to church, getting involved in other people's lives within the church, and having fellowship and the opportunity to be able to share with one another and the opportunity to be able to strengthen one another. All of those things are critical because what the enemy of our souls wants to do is to isolate us and make you think, you know what, you can just sit in your room and you can just you can just watch something on TV and go to church that way and you'll get great teaching and great worship and all that stuff but yeah but there's no fellowship you can't fellowship with a computer or a mobile phone you can't do that and so all of those things are great and that's why we put our stuff out on YouTube and out on Facebook so that it's available to people but it isn't intended to be a substitution for genuine fellowship within the body of Christ. You have access with confidence through faith in Him. And we have boldness. Another place he says we enter boldly into the throne room of God to find help in our time of need. We don't enter arrogantly. We should always pray and enter God's presence recognizing who we are and who He is. And recognizing that we are in Him and He is in us. So we can be bold to go before the Lord God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, 
and expect not to get torched into a tiny little cinder as soon as we arrive. But we cannot go with the boldness of arrogance saying, hey, you know, it's me, Pastor Kevin. You know all the great stuff I've done. You know, I'm waiting for my paycheck of blessing, Lord. So uh, this is what I'm ordering. No, no. He also says that his ministry is about not wanting them to lose heart. And specifically here, he says, at his tribulation. He's in jail. He's in prison in Rome. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He could have been executed after this imprisonment. He wasn't. He was freed and then was imprisoned later and executed. But he says, I don't want you to lose heart because I'm in prison. I'm in prison for you. It's your glory. Okay, here's one of those things where I don't understand that. There's a spiritual truth there that I don't fully understand. How is it their glory that he is in tribulation and in prison? I'm not sure I understand that. But it's the truth. So what is his prayer? What do we finally get at in his prayer? Verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, first, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. To be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. It doesn't matter how strong we are in the outer man. It doesn't matter what your physical stature is. It doesn't matter if you have been uh, handicapped in some way, physically. It doesn't matter if you are surrounded by tribulation. Where are you in the inner man? And Paul understood that because he was in prison in Rome at this time. He understood that it was the strength in his inner man that let him continue to minister through writing epistles four awesome epistles from the prison in Rome, that he was able to minister to his guards and to people in Caesar's household so that they were getting saved. He talks about that in another place, that, you know, don't, don't be bummed out, man. What's happened here? This is great. People are getting saved in Caesar's household here. So don't be bummed out. Well, he's got to be in that place where he's tapped into the strength of God's Spirit inside so that his inner man is strengthened so that those around him while he's in prison could say Paul what's up with you what why, why do you why are you so strong prison is intended to break you down that's what prison is all about is to break your will to break your spirit and here's this guy his will and his spirit man they're being strengthened and I can imagine some of the guards and some of those who are used to seeing what happens in the prisons to those they would put in there going, there's something different about this guy. What's wrong with this guy? And then they come to understand and to know. And that's Paul's prayer for them, that you'd be strengthened in the spirit, in your inner man. Secondly, I love this one. that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, doesn't Christ dwell in you through faith the moment that you got saved? Is Paul saying, I pray that you all would be saved? No. No. We lose some understanding here in the translation of the word dwell here. They try and capture it because dwell doesn't just mean to be there. It means to, you know, if you dwell somewhere, you're kind of moving in. You know, most of the people in this, I've made, probably everybody as I look around and the people that I know, you all have moved at least once in your life. Some of us multiple times, you know. And so, yeah, I lived there, I lived there. But where did you dwell? Where did you stay? Where did you hang out? What do you consider home? When you talk to someone who has moved around all their life and you say, so where are you from? It's interesting when they say, well, I'm from X, but I've lived all over the place. And other people say, well, I 
just lived all over the place. They feel like they have not dwelt anywhere. But the the meaning of the Greek word here, one of the Greek translators that I read said, it's the sense of it is to be at home there. To be welcome there. You know, that kind of turned my thinking around in the same way of, you know, Christ in me versus us in Christ. I think about, you know, I want to be in the Lord. I want to be at home with the Lord. I want to dwell with him. The idea here is, is Jesus dwelling in you? Is Jesus welcome in you? Does Jesus want to dwell there? Or is he going, man, where else could I be right now? <laughs> now, obviously, the Lord, I don't think, says that. Uh, but the sense of it is, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, may remain there, may feel at home, may be welcome in your life, not just coming and going, not just called upon in a need, but dwelling in your life. Boy, I don't know that I've come to that place as I consider this. I don't know that I've come to that place in my life where 100% of the time Christ is welcome. But boy, that's the place to be. And that's what Paul is praying for the Ephesians. Man, that's the place to be. It's where Christ is dwelling there. You know, when we go through extreme hardships, and boy, everything, all of our safety nets, all our safe places have been blown up. Our safety nets are cut. They're not going to catch us on the way down. All of the things that we've built in our lives of our network and everything else is gone, you know, and it's just you calling upon the Lord. Sometimes those are the most wonderful times of fellowship with God. Oh, the, your life might be torn up and you might be in anguish over the situation in life, but the relationship with God is actually more intense and more sweet and more strong than ever because Everything else is away, and you just, you, you want Christ to stay. No, 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 stay, dwell. You are welcome. You're more than welcome here. All right? At home. May Christ be at home in our hearts. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, all right, that's where, that's where we get rooted and grounded, not by our theo theological understanding, not by our tremendous works, but rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. That's where we get our, our strength, our foundation. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love may understand in all directions that which is unknowable, which is the love of Christ. That seems like asking for something impossible, doesn't it? I pray that you may know what can't be known. I think there's a, there's a sense in which especially if you have been in that place of separated from so much else and it's just you and the Lord, you do have an apprehension and that's what the word comprehension there means. May comprehend. It's actually the sense of the word is more apprehend, but it's not a word we use very much. But it's to not that you, if you comprehend something, you understand it. You can spit it back out on a, ta on a test. To apprehend it means it's yours. You might not fully understand it. You might not be able to put the formula down on paper, but you know it. It's yours. And I can tell you that I don't know the love of Christ. I don't have the formula for it. But you know what? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no pit too deep that Christ's love is not deeper. Paraphrase of Corey Ten Boom. There is nothing, 
Paul says, that can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And I have apprehended that, not just because I've read it and studied it in the scriptures and I know what Romans chapter 8 says, but because I have experienced being in that place of being separated from everything in my life, leaving the life that I knew, literally selling nearly everything that I had, and being separated from family and friends that I had at that time by my own sin and being confronted with the love of Christ that I thought, I had lost, that I had sold along with my possessions. But Christ's love penetrated. And now, I don't know how God can be that way because I can't be that way. And I don't fully comprehend it in terms of how does this work out exactly, but I know it. And if there's anything that I as a pastor can pass on to any one of you and anyone that I teach, it is that the love of Christ cannot be separated from you. You can choose to walk away from it. But you can never be separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Man, and if you are rooted and grounded in his love, you can apprehend that. And then that becomes the rooting and grounding itself. Because you know there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And therefore, I'm going to behave a different way because I want to love him who loved me first. And I can be strong in the midst of struggle or face a tribulation or some situation that it, it, it doesn't make sense to me, and God, I don't deserve this. Whatever, all the things that we go through. But wait a minute, I have apprehended the love of God. And so that I know, even in the midst of that tribulation, the love of God is greater. Is greater. And so great that Romans eight twenty eight comes true. For we know that God causes all things to work for good for those who are in Christ Jesus, the called according to his purposes. As I pointed out before, it doesn't say you're good. Sometimes the things we go through are Christ's love being demonstrated to somebody else through you. But God is good to you at all times. And he causes all things to work for good for the called according to his purposes. Rooted and grounded in love, you may know that which is unknowable because you can't find it's unknowable because you can't find the end of it there is no end there is no end that you may be filled with all the fullness of God that's my prayer for you too it's Paul's prayer for the Ephesians that's my prayer for you that you may be strengthened in the inner man, that Christ may be at home in your hearts, that you may be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ and have it apprehended in your life so that that's what you are walking and living in, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then Paul ends with a praise. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. Paul just prayed for us forever and ever. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above, not just above, but exceedingly above, not just exceedingly above, but exceedingly abundantly above, all that we can even think of or think of to ask. according to the power that's already in you. It's not, how can I come to that place of that exceedingly abundantly place of the Lord? His power is already in you. Earlier in the chapter 2, he says, that power is directed, it's aimed directly at you, his superabundant power. Paul in chapters 1 through 3 has given us 
a strengthening, or he's tried to, that is, I think, beyond any of the other books of the Bible. We're seated in the heavenlies with him. All of his power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and all that that means, it's aimed directly at you. And by the way, you apprehend that grace. You receive that grace from God, not by being a great, super abundant, super duper Christian, but by believing in him by grace through faith. Man. That is strengthening. You want to be strengthened in your inner man? Read the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians every day. Just, just plow right through it. Just read it like, you know, like you're reading the paper or anything else, but, but listen to it and consider it. And, and pick a verse to meditate on. And you will be strengthened because this is who God is. And then you want to know how to live your life? Well, we'll get to that in chapters 4 through 6. In the why, the therefore. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the revelation of your word that you have revealed to us this mystery and other things which were a mystery before Christ went to the cross and was raised again. And we thank you that you didn't leave us to figure this out ourselves. For we know your word is true when it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end their way leads to death. And so we could come up with a cool religion that would send us straight to hell. But Lord, you have revealed yourself through your word and by your spirit to each one of us. And we thank you for that, Lord. And now, Lord, I pray, just as Paul prayed, that you would strengthen each one of us in our inner man that we would come to that place where you are welcome and at home in our lives that we would come to that place of apprehending that which is unknowable the depths of your love and that we might be filled to the fullness of you in christ jesus help us lord Help us, Lord, to remember what is true, that we may walk in this world in the strength of your Spirit. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and grant you peace. May he lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you each and every day of your life through Jesus Christ who is our Lord and our Savior and our soon coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you.